Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone attending this event for coming to watch. My name is Dev Peyrat, and I'm a first year student here, and I'll be moderating this event. Today, I'm beyond excited to introduce our, our guests, screenwriters and Brown graduates, Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi. Hay and Manfredi, uh, excuse me, <laughs> most recently saw the release of the second season of their Emmy award-winning television adaptation of Trenton Lee Stewart's best-selling novel, The Mysterious Benedict Society for Disney+. Plus. Prior to that, Phil and Matt wrote Destroyer, which garnered Nicole Kidman a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress, as well as acclaimed thriller The Invitation, both directed by their frequent collaborator Karin Kusama. The pair also wrote such hits as Ride Along, Ride Along 2, and Clash of the Titans after debuting with the drama Crazy Slash Beautiful. Family-style film, Hay and Manfredi's production company with Kusama, is currently under a first-look deal with our MRC. For all of you watching, please submit some questions into the Q&A box below, as we'll have time for audience Q&A towards the end of this event. Now let's get into some questions. So both of you guys are Brown graduates, and I know you got started in a way in an improv group here, but I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit more about your time at Brown and how that's influenced your work today. Sure. Um, yeah, we started in an improv group that, that I believe is still going there called Improvidence. And, uh, but I would say in terms like that, obviously, you know, I, I met Phil and we started performing together and, and through that started uh, writing together. I would say that, you know, any theater class I took, I found so valuable to our writing just in terms of obviously like being exposed to so many different plays and, and, and things, but like in terms of getting an ear for dialogue, you know, and, and things like that and act like, you know, taking acting classes, all that stuff like factors, I think, into, into our writing. Yeah, I think that we, and I think this is probably still, like, still the case now, I'm not sure, but there, there was no, um, when we were at Brown, there was no like formal production, film production studies, for no. example. There was no film department in that way. And I, I did, I um, majored in English, but I took a lot of MCM classes. So that's that sort of study of film was something I could do, but it was really more about when we were at Brown making the thing that was great is the environment was great for making projects together with with our friends and with collaborators. And so the improv group is definitely our main activity. And then Matt and I would be we were in a you know production of new plays class where we wrote short plays and put them up. And so that was kind of our first that was what what at Brown really helped us to start developing you know, writing dialogue, um, thinking about scene work, thinking about structure of scenes, thinking about um, all of that through kind of like both writing things and acting in them and, you know, rehearsing improv, all that stuff. So it was definitely less direct than say like, you know, my wife went to NYU as an undergrad and was studying like film production techniques and cinematography and editing and, you know, practical, that kind of thing. That wasn't what we were doing at Brown, but we were gaining a lot of you know, kind of um, another type of experience that was really helpful to us. Yeah, for sure. Um, so as far as I can tell, um, the Mysterious Benedict Society is the first television series you guys worked on, or at least have been credited on. Um, so how has that, if at all, changed your writing process from, for example, writing for film? And what did you guys do to prepare for that? It's definitely different. And I think the main thing that's different is we, you have a writer's room. And so there's, you know, it's like when we're writing films, which is what almost really exclusively what we've done, we'd written a couple pilots, but we hadn't had a show in production. You, you, it's just me and Matt and whoever else is involved, the directors, the producers, et cetera. But um, it was a really interesting experience because we were partnered with a, a, a show running team so the four of us became a real creative kind of um, uh, group, creative collaboration. And then we had writers that were working in the room. So it's kind of the, the, the thing that's most different. There's two things that's most different. One is in process, having people who are there to help you <laughs> with ideas, with which is a shocker to film writers. You know, you're usually doing it all by yourself. And then the other big thing is in television, the writer, whoever is the writer in charge, and in this case, we were the, the creators and the final word on things. The writer is the final word, whereas in film, the director is the final word. Um, so every edit, it, you know, in the edit room, in the end, it's done when Matt and I would say it's done versus when we're making a film, it's whenever the director says they're done. And in film, we're 
Matt and I produce as well. So like the movies we make with Karin, my wife, are um, are very collaborative. We're very deeply involved in everything. Um, but still, it's like once it gets to the edit room, she's doing her thing with the editor. We're offering notes, but we're not in the nitty gritty of that. Television's different. Um, so that was that's another huge difference. Is the yeah, there's a level of uh, there's a level of control that you have as the creator of a show, and and the writer in general has in television that isn't the same in say a studio film. You know, we like Phil said, everything we every aspect of it goes through us last. So you quickly uh, find that you you have and have to have an opinion on on everything because everyone's looking to you, and it's it's actually a, a real it's a real privilege to because it's. Uh, you know, unlike a big budgeted uh, movie, uh, a, a television show, even though you you are collaborating with a lot of people and you're going through a notes process with the network and the studio, it you really have the chance to get something to 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 the finish line, really in the way you envisioned it. You know, in in all aspects of it. Where sometimes, you know, in it, with a bigger with a bigger movie, it's, it's it's a process of letting go and and you know being part of the final. You know, creative vision. So uh, going off that, um, not only with those bigger movies that, you know, you, you mentioned you have to kind of let go, um, but also those pilots that were never produced. Um, <clears throat> you know, you guys have written scripts that have, you know, uh, you've written all kinds of scripts. And um, I, I guess I'm with, for, with that, I'm curious about uh, how you stay true to the story you want to tell while also appeasing demand the demands of others, especially as you know, the level of control you can exert over the story varies. Yeah, I mean, our goal, whether, you know, our goal on, on every project, and it's obviously easier in the independent world and in television, is to be involved for as long as possible. And, and you know, I think we see ourselves as, you know, the people who were kind of like the guardians of the story. And, and I don't mean that in a contentious way, where we're like police, you know, like a policeman, like it's, it's, it's our job, obviously, to know the story inside and out. And so when we're in production, you know, we, you can offer a suggestion and say, you know, yes, you know, because things just change all the time. But if you're the one who's, who can be like, that's great, that change is fantastic, but you need to consider that it's going to affect X, Y, and Z down the road, because not everyone is thinking about those things in the larger scale. And so, you know, our goal is to, to you know, we like to, we like to get with a director early, um, and uh, we like to be involved. We, we like to have them on board, um, our whole production team on board as early as possible so that we can all kind of see the same thing going forward. And if it's a bigger studio movie, we, we try to remain uh, as involved as possible, you know, once it goes into production. And just to add to that, that there's a different, sometimes there's a different role on each production that, that we're asked to play. You know, like I think the bottom line is what Matt's saying is our job as screenwriters when we're making movies is to attempt to help to tell the story, but then transition into helping the director tell that story and seeing things through the eyes of the director. Um, and then kind of pouring all of our stuff about the story into that person's vision as well. Um, and that, that also includes, as you mentioned, a lot of studio, especially in a studio movie, but also in independent movies, there's always other voices like producers, actors, the studio. And as Matt said, you know, our allegiance needs to be to the story and to what we think the story is the best way to tell the story. But we also need to be open to and helpful with the other people who are um, collaborating with us. So, um, on a TV series, like in the same thing with TV, there's a there's a there's a streamer or a network, there's a studio, there's all these people. Um, in TV, it ultimately resolves to what exactly we want on the screen. In film, it's more, um, and it's different when we're working with Karin. Again, the three of us are a very like fluid, creative, you know, unit. Um, but in the end, we're trying to often as a writer, you're asked to balance a lot of impulses and and you know make things certain things happen in in a way. Um, that you might not have thought of or thought was the the primary way to do it, but but if the director is pursuing that or an actor really is pursuing a certain way into their character that's fruitful but just different, it's our job to then move over there and figure out how to help them make that work. You know. Uh, <clears throat> so shifting gears a little bit back to the mysterious Benedict Society. So 
I mean, these were books, this is based on a series of books that I read when I was in elementary school. And these books are not, and the show is not necessarily as dark or adult as some of, some of your other work. So I'm curious about, um, you know, among your other work, there's so much variance in genre and tone. Um, how does considering genre and audience affect your writing process? Yeah, I think that we generally, um, we have done a lot of different types of things. And I think oftentimes I think people are told, and maybe it's good advice for a lot of people to really specialize in something and become known for something or some one, one area. But I think for us generally, we are, I think we're genuinely interested in a lot of different things and genuinely interested in a lot of different types of movies and TV shows. And so, um, Part of for us, part of the inspiration, I think, is to explore themes we want to explore and characters we want to explore in different contexts, in a horror movie, in a top thriller, in a kind of whimsical, magical world, in different, you know, in, in a fantasy world, in all these different things. And I think um, for us, it's, it's it just gen genuinely comes from a love of different types of filmmaking and a desire to want to see what it's like to get in there and tell a story in those in those forms it's definitely not calculated to do different types of things but i think you know ultimately um we just kind of we try to never be calculated about anything in our career necessarily we just try to go where we're to the stories we're excited about yeah i think we, we just do. remain open to themes and characters that that intrigue us and you know in the case of mysterious benedict society we were just coming off of two movies that i i can't show my kids for quite some time but um but the the themes you know the 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 books though very light on their feet are coming from a, a real they've got some real depth to them and the themes they explore and the way you know where they start these kids is is really interesting and so it, just that those you know so we we read this book that maybe maybe uh, based on the past couple of things, like people might not have expected us to respond to, but, you know, reading the book and, and, you know, something really connected about what those kids were going through and what this book had to say. And so, and so we, you know, we're, we're psyched to, uh, to, to get, to get a chance to adapt it. And it's funny because there's some things that I was thinking when Matt was talking, like if you, were to hang around with us, we're more like the Benedict world than we are like the invitation world. Thank, thankfully, you would, we're not in cults or anything. Um, but in terms of it's interesting, something people are surprised when they're like, you, you know, you guys are not these dour, like heavy personages, but sometimes that's you want to explore, you know, we're all so many different things as people. So we want to explore different parts of who we are. And then sometimes that's more like Benedict is very, was very, um, it's easier to identify our everyday like vibe with that show in some ways than it is the, the more dark and yeah. heavy work, which is also a very important part of, you know, it's in there too. <laughs> so. Um, so one of the things you guys just mentioned was being interested in different themes. Um, and so I'm curious about, um, are there any particular themes you guys find to be particularly worthwhile? And more generally, um, what makes a story worth pursuing and developing into a feature script or a pilot? I mean, the, the, like the theme that we come back to, which is perhaps not surprising a lot, is, is, is a, a partnership. <laughs> and, the, and the ins and outs of partnership, ride along, RIPD, like all those, like all those things, um, and it's probably because you're you're just getting toward an essential relationship with between two characters and 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 the, so some of the variances between all those things. But I would say that sometimes we approach things through theme, but sometimes the spark can be as simple as you know F Phil had an idea for for a he, there was a tableau an ending, and uh, that became the invitation. It, it, it sparked a discussion that quickly led to themes. Uh, but but it, it started with a little thing. And the other day I was listening to some music that I thought was incredible and came in thinking like, I want to I want to write something that that feels like that, mm -hmm. you know, and so and then it, then 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 the discussion kind of flows from there. And I think that's how we but it, yeah, it does. I would say like generally like, you know, even if it's a broad comedy for us, it needs to 
feel like it's about something. Um, you know, even if it's not, you know, it's, that doesn't mean it has to be didactic, but for us, to, for, for us to know, you know, you can put, you can put the outline in front of us and, and, and I, I, I know that this character has to go from A to B and I know technically what happened has to happen. But for me personally, I think for Phil as well, if we don't know the why and what it's saying, it's very difficult to write that. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, totally. And I think that, that it's theme for, I know for me personally, it's really important to understand. Sometimes you discover it a bit as you go. Um, and sometimes you really have objectives at the beginning. And I think some of our movies we have in a way, like, you know, I know the invitation was very driven by some thematic questions that we had, like driven by the idea of, of, of grief and how people, different people process it and, uh, and how sometimes those ways are, are helpful and sometimes they're very hurtful. And, um, you know, the question of, of, of how, um, can you know someone or the question destroyer of, is it possible to atone for certain things or is atonement impossible sometimes? Um, all those things that like are the big questions, I think can, can, can be, the, the key is how that you turn them into drama. And in a weird way, the way we approach theme is what I realize is if you, if you know what the thing you're writing is about, there's always something for the characters to talk about. Then you're, you're always, um, whether they're directly talking about it or not, if you're telling a story, that is circling certain ideas, the characters will naturally start to array themselves around that idea and represent different parts of it. Represent the person who fears change more than anything else. Represent the person who unhealthily pursues change. Represents the person who in between, who is trying to figure out what's positive change and what's negative change. All that sort of thing gives characters a way to kind of conflict with each other and try to convert each other and try to ally with each other or be against. So anyway, I think that's like a really um, important thing about theme. Another thing I'll mention for people who are writers is something that I, I can't take credit for this. Some, it's kind of a distillation of some, a lot of writers that I know talking, but we kind of realize a way to look at theme is not kind of like a lesson or a moral of the story, which some people think that's what theme is, is like, what's the moral of the story? that I think to me theme is, is a question that has more than one legitimate answer. You know what I mean? Like, like it's not, you know, killing people is wrong. You know, what do you mean? We should be like, yes, killing people is wrong. You know, it's uh, something that says like um, a question one can ask where the, um, you know, where the answer is not obvious. Um, and that's what, that's a rich theme in a movie or a TV show. And that's what's interesting to explore. So one of the things you just mentioned was characters and them representing theme. Um, so I'm also curious about what the process of character development looks like for you guys, especially given the distinctions between, say, the invitation, which is smaller and more intimate, and something you know much more big and operatic like Clash of the Titans. I think we we definitely sometimes it, it also depends on the on the project. A lot of times I realize it's through their voice, you know on the page and how they speak and how much they speak and how comfortable they are interjecting their opinions in the scenes. And so we start out understanding who the characters are on some level, like um, uh, Matt and I talk through sort of like, here's their general, we sometimes talk about their affect, you know, like here's how they present to the world because someone can present to the world as like, the boss and in charge, but you know their character is, they know they're not the boss and they feel extremely vulnerable. So every decision they make is about trying to make themselves seem like the boss. There's other people who in the group are very recessive, but everyone always turns to them and, and they kind of get the final word. And that's a really interesting thing. So sometimes it's affect in character, like this person's really funny, you know, or this person, literally does not understand humor, you know, or this person is extremely volatile and always takes everything personally and then has to apologize immediately. We create those sort of things. And then you start, when you start interacting, sometimes you just, you start discovering them. So you're discovering that process. And 
you know, we're discovering on something we're writing right now that, you know, the, the protagonist of it is very, um, is not the manufacturer of the conversation or the text. It's not who she really is, but the challenge is to make sure everything always turns back to refer to her and that we are always seeing everything that's happening through her perspective, sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and I would say that, like, you know, like Phil said, it, it so much of it is discussion before we go to write and, you know, because we need to know how these people are going to interact and what's important to them. But also, like, in the writing itself, like, once you just, at some point, you just have to start. And, you know, Phil and I tend to write out of, we have an outline and we write out of order. We choose scenes that appeal to us. And one of us takes the first shot at one of them. And on our movie Destroyer, which is about this female detective, there, I the, the scene that helped me understand her was a scene where I knew that she wasn't going to be talking much. I mean, she's already kind of not the most talkative character, but someone was going to be talking at her. And I was curious, I was like, well, how does that, how is that going to work? How does this, because, you know, she needs to, she needs to be alive and she needs to, we need, we need to know her. And she, she ultimately by not talking needs to be driving the scene. And so by just taking a stab at that scene, it helped me understand her affect more and her, what, she, what, what, like was, what was going on while she was listening to this, you know, horrible person. Um, but yeah, so, so, um, and also, you know, later on in the process, once we get, once, once you get into production and you're cast, Phil and I, in an ideal world, like to sit down with the actors and it's not even a rehearsal, it's just chatting about their character. And it, sometimes they can, sometimes some lines of dialogue will come up, but really it's a discussion about who this person is. I mean, a lot of actors we know like to ask questions about their backstory and sometimes we'll end up writing a document that we hadn't even considered before mm -hmm. just to give them something to, to kind of base their journey on. And it requires some sensitivity too, to add to what Matt was saying. Like, when we did Destroyer, Nicole Kidman wanted to have a document, you know, that just kind of gave her some sense of how her character got to where she got, but it really was very specifically only for her. Like it wasn't ever going to be disseminated beyond that because the other thing with that we want to be cognizant of is we don't want to box the actor into choices based on their backstory that they would not make. And that would ultimately be good for the character. So there's that interesting thing if you want to be specific, but you want to be open to, especially when you're talking about the experience of that character to this point, you don't want to do anything that feels limiting necessarily. You want to do things that are helpfully specific, but not kind of forcing the actor to reconceive everything about what drew them to that character. And so I think that's a really fun and interesting part. And then sometimes it's like we, I mean, I remember back on Clash of the Titans, it's kind of funny, like Ray Fiennes who played Hades wanted to have a character bio of Hades. And it's like an interesting thing to write a Greek God's character by. It's not like, you know, he attended hell university, um, with a, you know, major in, uh, concentrated in uh, uh, lightning bolts. <laughs> like, um, so it's like, but we found a way to do that, to psychologize, to make that all about like, this is a person who is one of the most powerful beings in the universe, but is always gonna be in second or third place. And he's just tired of it. He's just tired of not being number one. And that sort of thing is helpful. So, so anyway, yeah, sometimes there are documents, sometimes there are conversations, but it's really interesting to, and sometimes the actor will bring you something that you feel is just wrong and the director feels is wrong and you have to find a way to walk through that because again, as Matt said, ultimately you have to protect the story and you have to help explain to them why that would negatively affect the story if some trait or backstory bit they wanted was in there. So you just mentioned Clash of the Titans, um, and obviously you guys have written the Mysterious Benedict Society show, but you've written a bunch of other adaptations. Um, I'm particularly curious about um, R.I.P.D. and Eon Flux, especially given how obtuse the source material for Eon Flux was. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm generally curious about um, how adaptation changes the way you approach a project or whether it changes at all. Hmm. Does it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Phil? Yeah, I think... Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to mull that over. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that, that for me, it's... It, the, the thing that changes is you're, 
Our first thing we try to do when we figure out, when we're, when we're approaching adaptation, is to figure out what the essential, essential thing is about it that is makes us love it and makes the people who love it, love it. Because you, you can't be driven by just the principle of like translating something, you know, the fidelity of something. Because there's certain things that lend themselves to a very direct translation. You know, for example, like, you know, in the... the Plot-wise, the first book of Mysterious Benning Society, which is the first season of the show, is very directly the plot of the book, with, with a lot of additions and some changes, big changes too, but it just lent itself to that. It was, we could see it. And in the second book, there's a lot of spiritual stuff that's great, and a lot of things that, sequences and characters that we were like, oh, this is essential. These are great. But the plot, just based on where we'd gone in season one, and based on the book itself was just not as directly translatable. So that involved more invention. So it's determined yeah, so you can, that amount of invention in some ways. Yeah, I think in that instance, like Eon Flux is another example where the source material was was uh, at times just like you couldn't, there, there were things that were so, it's, it was so beautiful and so interesting and so not surreal, but, but there would, you know, there were things that were just kind of unproducible, you know, realistically. And so it's it's trying to capture what is so great about that. What's the what are the ideas behind that? What what how is there a way to kind of take what is there and what people what what people love the core thing and find a way into something that that can be that can be made. And you know, I think finding those always trying to find those like touchstones if we can from the thing because because we're never we don't we're never going to adapt something that we don't like i mean there's certainly the cynical endeavor of mm -hmm. of I, I you know taking a title and just and 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 just discarding but but you know we always if we if we're going to take on a project it's out of love and so it's it's tr it's always trying to like like phil said remain true to what the core of this thing is that people tend to love and whatever we add being like spiritually congruent with yeah. whatever's there, even if it feels different, you know, um, that there's a, hopefully that's the goal and you would do the best we can to like make something that is, can walk alongside it because sometimes the best way to look at adaptation is that it doesn't replace the thing. It's a companion in some ways. All right. Uh, great. So um, I'm also curious about, uh, the production company you guys have with Karin Kusama, family style films, and uh, whether or how that's changed the way you work, uh, or what demands maybe that's introduced into your life. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, you know, uh, we've we've made uh, three three films with Karin, and we've got more in development, and um, Phil is biased, but I can say that, because uh, he's married to her, but, you know, we, she's a she's a fantastic collaborator, a fa fantastic director, and you know we just want to keep making movies. I think the things we've done with with her as, and us as a trio have been some of the more creatively fulfilling things we've done. And so, the idea was to make a company that could continue these these films we make, uh, branch out into television, and also like one thing that we like to do is there's so many permutations of what we're interested in. Like, you know, we can, we, we want to produce uh, other writers, you know, uh, and so come in and an executive produce and, and shepherd things through, you know, there's so many different permutations of our roles that we can, that we can do all of which kind of like scratch a certain itch. And so it was exciting to, to kind of codify that and, and, and form a company, you know, so we can kind of pursue all these different interests we have. Yeah, it kind of gives us a structure, an infrastructure to to get involved in more things. And we don't we're, we're we don't get involved in a tremendous amount of things because the, the, the type of people we all are is very focused on. We always have a few things going, but we don't want a million things going. And so it's but it does allow us to have this structure where we can, you know, when people someone writes a great pilot and they send it to us. If it's something that we really feel we can help with, it's great to have that feeling of like, okay, we can actually produce this. We don't have to write it. We're it's that's not going to be our role in this, but we're going to help develop it. We're going to produce it and help get it into the world. Those are all really exciting things. And and the biggest change I think for me and Matt as writers was when we started producing, and that was with our independent films. Um, and then that translated us into producing television. And and I think 
as a writer, the sooner you can be involved in producing the work, the more um, fulfilling it's going to be because you have more of a it, more more input, but also just more presence. The more you're you're if you if you want to be, you should be on the set. You should be involved in all the marketing discussions, all that stuff. So we started out as screenwriters, 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 and then eventually we'd be involved in in um, some big studio movies where just because of the type of, type of work we do and, and kind of our relationships and, and how we approach things, we were kind of asked to be de facto producers on some of these movies while not being credited producers and realizing, oh, this is a skill set we have and that we really want to develop is to be not just produce providing the material, but helping to get the material into the world. So the company really helps us to do that, you know, gives us a banner to do that under sort of yeah um so the last thing i wanted to ask you guys before getting into some audience q a um was just is there anywhere you guys find uh, particular inspiration for stories uh does it just happen naturally um or are there sources you go back to yeah i think it's really interesting because i mean generally for us it usually takes a really long time for something to be one of us to have an idea and then it just kind of marinate long enough to start thinking okay this is a movie we want to do or a show and then to actually write it and so like we have a very we really let i think we spend a lot of time just sitting and thinking about things and so usually i'd say from i'm trying to think to all of our projects usually it's either character you know, like we, a character that we just think of, like, what if there was a person like this? It all starts with a what, you know, what if there was a person who um, left, uh, left uh, their community and they disappeared and then they came back a couple of years later and even to the person they loved the most or loved them the most, their, their ex, they seemed unrecognizable, like something had happened to them and they were unreachable. That's part of the premise of the invitation. And like, that was just an interesting situation. And I don't know where it came from, but we started talking about that. What would that be like? And then it seemed to collide with other themes we've been thinking about. So sometimes it's just conversations that Matt and I have all day about life and the world and, and emotions and, and people. And sometimes, you know, like Matt was saying, this, this recent one that he came up with, it's like a feel and a vibe that came from listening to certain music at a certain time and feeling like, oh, wait, how could you capture that visually and character wise and how could that be different? So yeah, it's usually conversations, honestly, or it's, um, you know, just something that we love that we don't yet know how to, how to turn into a movie, but we will hopefully someday. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say like on a micro level, it's just, I mean, like it sounds like simple, but like, just like listening to people, like mm -hmm. I would like, there's so many, bits and pieces of conversations that I remember or remember to write down from my family, from my, you know, my kids, like all, all the, you know, from, from just like years and years ago that find their way into various things we do. And, you know, it, 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 it could be, in a, it obviously is usually in a totally different context, but like, you know, I'm, 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 I'm often writing down little things that someone has said I know plenty of writers who carry around a little notebook and, but it's just being like listening and being open to those things because like, I find that, that you're, you're kind of writing when, when you don't even know it, if you're, if you're committed to like a creative process, anything, you know, once you kind of step away from it and then you're walking around, you know, like joke with Phil that like, so many of our problems, like creative blocks are solved in our walk from like the car, I mean, the office to the car, you know, you just, sometimes if you step away, like the inspiration strikes you when you're in the shower or taking a walk, you can walk on the dog or something like that. I find those, those things, maybe it's not inspiration, but it's, it's, uh, it just gets you out of a way of thinking a circular way of thinking that that I find uh, helpful. So it's it's almost like being comfortable not sitting at your computer all day, being comfortable that like when you go and do something else, your brain is still working. Yeah. And I think, I mean, maybe it's the obvious thing to say, but maybe it's not that obvious is 
also just seeing good movies to me always yeah. does something. And especially if they're very different than what we are going to do, because, you know, like just for example, just this Saturday, Karin and I went, there was a screening of this Russian production of uh, War and Peace that was made in the 60s. And it's like, it's seven hours long. Like, and it's, so it's like it was kind of an endurance test in a way, but it was also really incredible. And I don't think we're going to make a seven hour war and peace, you know, well, but there, you never know. But there were moments in there where I was like, the filmmaking was so different. It came from such a different aesthetic and such a different type of way of looking that I was like very inspired. Like, oh, the way that they chose to construct this scene is and so I'd say like watching things that come from a narrative tradition that's not like the US film business, watching stuff from around the world can be really inspiring to you. And also like just little things, like there was a scene in that where there's two people having a conversation that's pretty intimate. And then you realize like halfway through the scene, there's another person who's just been sitting there like listening, they're just there, they just haven't said anything. And it was such a great, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe that's something that, would be useful to us sometime. I hadn't thought of that as a scene technique, you know? So yeah. anyway, yeah. Well, also we're in a, I think we're in a different, obviously we're in a different time now than, than when Phil and I were growing up, but like, you know, I seen, I was in a we were in a period of time growing up where like plenty of good movies, but like there were a lot of them, like the majority of them were very predictable in the, both their structure and, and, and the way things, you know, hashed, you know, worked out. You know, um, and so like when I was first exposed to like the conspiracy movies of the seventies, you know, where where the ending was ambiguous, like the good guy like often lost. You know, like these were kind of like revolutionary things, which I think like not revolutionary, but they just weren't as common. You know, like that's why I think I think Seven, that movie Seven, hit so hard was it was like, wait a second, now now when I go to see a movie, I'm not necessarily going to expect it to end well. You know, um, I, I might not know what happens. Um, and so, like Phil said, exposing yourself to not, not you know, different countries, folk, but also different periods of time mm -hmm. where, where the prevailing thing was different than what it is now. All right, so thank you guys so much for those answers. Um, let's get into some audience Q&A questions. So um, the first question we have in the chat is, um, <clears throat> You guys mentioned some of the log logistical differences, um, but they'd love to know if you approach writing specifically for film versus TV series uh, differently. A little bit. I think the process for television writing is is uh, you know it, it's it's much more it's much more collaborative in terms of you know your every step. You it's also. I'd say in television, you, you, what happens is you write you write a very detailed outline. It's I was it's almost like a third of the length of the actual script itself, and you're trying to, you're you're come on kind of communicating everything that's going to happen to the stu studio and network, and then uh, you know you then then you you write from there, and that's not a process that we specifically do. Phil and I tend to, our outlines tend to be much more shorter. They're beat sheets uh, for for many of our films. And like Phil said, like the process of of sitting down in a room and hashing out an entire season, um, uh, you know, with with a group of people is is not something we had we had done before. It's a totally different process to kind of work through like eight mini movies at once. And there's something satisfying about it because like with 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 a with a with a traditional feature where you don't think there's gonna don't assume there's gonna be a sequel, you know whatever you whatever you know whatever you don't get in there whatever doesn't make it in and can't make it in is 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 lost but like you know the opportunity to explore characters over and over and over again the same characters and watch them evolve over the course of many more hours is is a uh, i mean it's, it's not necessarily different writing them but it's but it's different it's a different uh level of satisfaction i think there's also something, I mean, answer it maybe from a different angle. There is also something uh, inherently different, which is like in movies, I think a rule of thumb, I mean, it's not true of every movie, but I think it's true usually whether, even if it's a tiny, tiny in the indie relationship drama or the biggest epic in the world, with a movie, you're you're telling the story basically of the most important day or days of these people's lives. 
the most impactful, the most the, the most giant, the most um, um, change ridden time of their lives. That's why you're telling the story of this movie. Um, but with TV, that's not possible. You're telling a story of a period of time, of a story of a period of time of these characters um, evolving. And so the difference also is like in a movie, you know, and I know this is true of actors. When I talk to actors about how the process is different, in a movie, you know what the journey is exactly. You, you, by the time you're going to make it, you know, in making the story, you, you, you figure out what the character is going through and what their sort of character arc is. And in TV, they have that, but it can either be over a very, very long period of time or it can involve a lot of setbacks. So they can take one step forward and two steps back and one step forward and two steps back. And you can be watching a character develop more, um, uh, not comprehensively, but like develop more as a um, process. And it's a more, more um, um, impactful process in movies sometimes. It has to happen quicker. It has to happen, it has to be reduced to like very pivotal moments. And so I think that's a big difference in approaching it is in a, in a film, you're inherently looking and it's sometimes it's hard to adjust with. Like in film, you get trained and I think very good reason, you get trained to be focused on only the essential, like what is truly essential and nothing gets filmed that cannot be said to be essential. And in television, it still has to be essential, but it can be, in sometimes it can be essential in different ways. It can be an enjoyable diversion that ultimately gives you some insight into one of the characters, and that's fine in television. Whereas in a film, you would never have time, or frankly, it wouldn't work to do that diversion. It's structurally not part of it. And the last thing I'll say is like, I think film inherently has more in common you know, with with um, like say opera in a way, or with um, a, with a short story, and television is is maybe more like a novel in some ways, and more um, uh, abil the ability in the mundane to slowly build to something. You know, uh, and I think in film, even if it's a small film, in my opinion, at least, it has to be extremely impactful at all times. So. All right. Um, <clears throat> so the next question we have uh, is you guys have worked on so many projects together. Are there any that stand out as particular favorites? I think for, for me, the Invitation and Destroyer were, uh, were favorites just because A, working with Karin is, 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 so, is so much fun and so great. And also, you know, it's, it's we were, in, we, they turned out exactly like we had envisioned them, you know, except Karin takes it and, and, and elevates it further, you know? And so that being, uh, getting like from soup to nuts, having, uh, being a part of every aspect of production, um, and, and having a, a, a greater degree of control, creative control over the production and, and being able to ensure that it's the way you envisioned it that's that's it's really satisfying and it kind of i would say in the film world it almost exclusively exists in the independent world you know and not not to say that like studio filmmaking is is like there's there's can be it can be incredibly satisfying and really fun to be just like a smaller part of this greater collaboration but like i would say that like the, those two films for me were 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 it yeah i i would agree and i also think you know, I I would put Mysterious Banding Society in that too. It was always oh, yeah. such a great experience, um, and on every level. Um, but yeah, those two movies, and also, but I'll also add this too. Like every single one of them had something incredible about the process. You know, and even uh, the thing that is encouraging or that I found great is even I mean, sometimes not all of our movies were embraced. <laughs> when they came out to to uh, be to to put it lightly so like sometimes you make a movie you pour everything into it and people just generally don't like it or it doesn't work or it's you know and and that doesn't change the experience of making it so every movie we've made we've had incredible relationships we've made lifelong friends we've had um you know just truly grown and learned and all that stuff so it doesn't all just rely on how the movie is ultimately perceived the process is really interesting and they can also be very different in what we 
our role. I'll show you one example in the ride along movies, for example, Matt and I like had a role that was really specific and really gratifying, which was to step in and help tell stories with a very strong group of producer, director, actors who just like, like we just stepped into that core and tried to make it happen for those guys. And, and, and to be able to do that was extremely satisfying with something that's, you know, that more comes directly from us and our experience, we have a different role in it, but like they all have a, there's a different way to fit in to all of them. That's, you know, can be really great. All right. Um, the next question we have is um, how do you guys approach writing collaboratively? A lot of arguing. Yeah. Constant arguing at all. I mean, it really is like, though, you know, I feel like Matt and I, our arguments and fighting percentage has gone down over the years. Check with He's, Karin about it. Yeah. Yeah. Karin has, has uh, moderated for us sometimes. But I mean, I think it's like, what's interesting now is like, we, we have really evolved to be very similar in so many ways, and especially in how we write. And so we tend to, it almost doesn't matter which of us writes whatever scene. We tend to like write the outline together, split up, write scenes separately, and then send them back, and then we go through them together. But there's no scene where it'd be like, oh, Matt, only Matt could write that scene, or only Phil could write that scene. Like, I can't, you know, and though there might be, it's kind of a beautiful thing about collaboration when you're like, there's times when I'm looking at the outline and I'm like, I just don't know. I know why that scene has to exist and I know that it's going to be good, but I just don't know how to do it right now. And usually Matt is like, oh, I know how to do it. You know, like, like we, we kind of almost draft the scenes when we get together, like we look at all the scenes and this is a very helpful process thing for those of you who are writers that it took me a long time to learn, but I think is helpful to know. We do the outline, we have all the scenes, and then there's certain scenes you look like, I cannot wait to write that scene. Like that to me is the heart of the whole thing. And Matt will have, sometimes they'll be the same and sometimes they'll be different. And so we kind of go through and I say, I want to write that scene. And Matt says, okay, great. I'll write that scene. And then I say, I'll write that scene. And at the end, there's usually a few scenes that nobody wants to write. And that's very instructive. There's always a reason. It's not because they're just too awesome and we're too afraid to like, peak too early. It's usually because there's something wrong with those scenes or our conception of them, or maybe they don't even need to be in the story at all. And so in a way that process helps us sometimes figure out what's really important in the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we, we used to sit together in front of one computer and, and write everything like one person types and the other person talks and, and, there's a there's value to that, but there's also you know at times you just want to be like I'm, I'm just trying to write this really intense monologue. Just leave me alone. Leave me alone. <laughs> let me let me do this and I'll get back to you. Uh, but but I'll say like sometimes like Phil like if I say I'm going to take this scene and Phil will say well, I'm just going to send you some bits of dialogue that I thought were cool and maybe you can work those in if they appeal and and then yeah like Phil said we we once we Frankenstein it all together we 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 go through it all and edit the whole thing and together, which then we're sitting in the room together, going through the entire script and rewriting. It also leads to a general piece of advice that to, to that is like, any of you guys who write know, it's, it's a truly, at least for me, to actually want to write something is a gift. Like that's, that's incredible. Like a lot of times you're like, I, I just don't feel it. I don't want to, you know, so whenever we see a, whenever a scene happens where I'm like, oh, I can't wait to write that scene. I write, my recommendation is write that scene immediately. Like, don't wait till you get to it. You know what I mean? Oh, that scene takes place like two thirds of the way through the movie. I would just write that now. Don't wait for to get there because I've never thought starting at the very beginning is necessary. And, and sometimes you realize the movie starts 10 pages later than you thought it had to. And you don't have to, by writing the later stuff, you realize what the focus is. So anyway, that's just kind of a related piece of advice. Um, so our next question is from Ben. Thank you, Ben. Uh, how did you guys get started in the industry as writers? Uh, and what would your recommendations be for someone looking to break into the industry as a writer or someone with a similar career path? Um, I'd say I'll just, I'll take the second part first, which is the, the one like job you have now is to write like what you think is your best script possible that the one that exemplifies your voice because all the development executives 
you know, all the agents, they're all looking for a unique voice, especially like it, it, it and so it's, it's getting something, it's not chasing trends, it's not writing what you think might be popular, it's writing something that, that you, th and it could be, it could be a movie about the ast an asteroid hitting the earth, it can be a big ac action thing, but writing something that is very specifically you, that, that has a voice and a point of view, writing, getting, getting something that you are, are completely confident with is, is the job now, because everything else falls from there. Phil and I wrote a number of scripts uh, before our first one went out. And uh, so uh, just how we got a job, we, we, uh, we knew uh, we wrote a number of scripts. Uh, when we've had one that we thought was fantastic, we, we sent it to like the one person we knew uh, who was a- Through Brown uh, University. Yeah, who was a lawyer. Uh, their dad was an entertainment attorney and is still our attorney now. And uh, he set us up with a couple of agents. Um, uh, we went with one that we felt great about, and we sent we sent it out wide. And we got like at the time there were many more little kind of boutique production companies, and we we met about forty of them. And uh, for number forty passed it to number forty one, and that person had a script that they wanted us to look at and possibly rewrite. And so we came in and pitched what we would do on that script. And about three meetings later, we had like our first job. And okay. we've been working kind of since then, but but that was that was kind of how it happened. And that's, that's a story that's kind of common, you know, I would say in terms of- Yeah, that. at least from our era, like it's, it's I mean, it's the other thing has, to be, has yeah. to be said is like the business has changed a lot and some has stayed really the same, some has stayed, it has changed. And I think a lot of the opportunities now are in television. And so thinking about, again, writing that thing, it really is, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, there's no magic bullet, there's no magic answer. And also because people, everybody I know has a different story. There's not a common thread among them. It usually involves, but it does involve you having something written that really shows who you are as a writer and a person. And it doesn't have to be, like when we looked at writers to hire for Mysterious Bandit Society, it was never like who's written something like it. It was more just who's written something that we think that we like and that we think is interesting and that we think has a sense of humor or has a certain perspective that is unique or any of that stuff. So and we looked at all different, we looked at plays, we people who had written plays, we looked at yeah. people who had written short stories, like it, we like intense hostage dramas. Like we just like, we, we, we just like, our belief was that like, if you're a writer, you can, you know, it, it'll, it'll come out like if, you know. Yeah. And then practically, the other thing to say is like, it, you know, it, getting very practically getting that script and then finding some way to, um, and I think it's still important to say to go to Los Angeles and to find a way to, it doesn't have to be a job, even like a, a great job in the industry, find a job in the industry, a way in that allows you to start meeting people and get exposed to how TV and film are actually made, whether it's being a PA production assistant on a set or in an office, whether it's being someone's assistant, whether it's being, um, uh, you know, in, in the writer's room, there's very specific jobs. The, the writer's PA sometimes then becomes the writer's assistant opportunity, then becomes a writing opportunity. Um, but what's important is to to see if you can get involved some way in the business um, and just get into the water, like kind of just, just start to learn the language and learn, you know, learn the business in a way. But as Matt, to go back to the beginning, as Matt said, the, the, the one thing is, and I know it, it, it probably, you know, I, it must seem incredibly daunting when you look at like breaking in. But what I will say is if you, are true to your own writing, you're going to give yourself the best shot to not chase something like, oh, this kind of thing is popular. I don't really like horror movies, but I'm going to try to write a horror movie because they're popular. You have to kind of come upon it honestly. And my advice would be if, the, if you happen to like genre, that's a great way to do it. That's a great way to show people what you can do and tell stories that are important. Um, and to put your personal, I mean, this is an example I've used many times, but it's the truth is like, and maybe to answer one of the subsequent questions, what I think is if not the, but maybe one of the best movies in the world is Alien. And it's basically about a workplace yep. issues, a bunch of workplace issues that takes place in space. 
and then an alien comes. Like it's about a shitty workplace and then an alien comes. So like everyone can understand a shitty workplace, you know. I also will say that you you have an opportunity now that we didn't have as readily, which is the ability to just make something, yeah. you know, on your phone. And it doesn't have you, it doesn't have to, you can start small, make a little, make a little short, make, you know, make a little documentary, make like either the the means are are there and so cheap now. And you know, there are I mean there are plenty of like people who break in that way, you know, whether it's a like, like social media or or YouTube or something like that. There are plenty of people like that. I don't I don't I wouldn't recommend that's the the only way to go. I mean, obviously it's just you just have to start writing, but like you do have the ability to create stuff that does get noticed or that furthers your ability. I mean, like yeah. you got to write a few and fail, you know, and, and to learn yeah. what, to learn your voice, to learn what you're good at and what you need to work on. And that's a hugely important part to come back to, I think, because sometimes Matt and I will go to, you know, writer conferences and speak or get, be involved in Q and A's and things and like this. And the one thing you can control is your own craft. And, and it is helpful to, get better at it. You know, it's not like just what, what's a, like a workaround or how do I get, it's so hard, you know, like they, that part of like, I wish I had like a number of tickets I could hand out. Like here's, here's an agent, here's a manager, here's, but in the end, what you can control is it is useful to get better and better at the craft of screenwriting for its own sake. And then that turns into, you know what I mean? Like, it's not putting the cart before the horse. It's like, I'm going to become great at this. And that's going to be my calling card ultimately. And just to quickly touch on Gus Morfoot's question, what is the best movie? Um, I agree. Phil is Phil's pretty close with Alien, but I will say that- But like, not right, but not correct, according it, to that. It shifts for me, and it's usually like the best movie I've seen recently in the movie that makes me love movies, and, and it shifts all the time. Sometimes it could be In the Mood for Love. Sometimes it could be Alien. Sometimes it could be Spinal Tap. It could be- it shifts. I was going to say it's always This is Spinal Tap. Yeah, that's it's still funny 40 years later. If you can be funny 40 years, it's a lot. I remember watching uh, uh, LA Confidential recently, and it's a movie I love. And it just like, I just, when I was done with it, I just wanted to watch more movies because I, I, I loved it so much. And I have that experience a lot. And so it shifts. There is no one right answer, Gus Morefoot. Mm -hmm. right. Except Alien. Yeah. <laughs> And Bad News Bears, that's the right answer. That's right. actually, that's the right answer. All right, so um, thank you both so much for being here. Um, I'm honored to have been thank able- Thank you, Dan. Thank yeah, you. Um, I'm honored to have been able to virtually welcome you guys back to Brown in this way. Um, and I'd also like to thank those of you that are watching uh, for being here and submitting your questions. Um, as a final reminder, we're also screening Renfield tonight at seven at Granoff. Um, so yeah, everyone have a great day. Thanks again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody.